Today I've got two problems from the 2005 Croatian Math Olympiad. And I think I've mentioned on the channel before that I've been to Croatia a few times to a conference that happens every other summer in Dubrovnik. And in fact, I know a couple people at the University at Zagreb. In addition, I have a paper that just appeared in a Croatian math journal. Maybe I'll put some information about that on the screen right now. Okay, so anyway, let's look at these two problems. So first off, we want to find all non-negative integers, x, y, and z, such that this number, 13xy45z, is divisible by 792. What I mean by this number, I don't mean like 13 times x times y times 45 times z. I mean x, y, and z are missing digits from this, let's see, seven digit number. Anytime you wanna show that one number is divisible by another, you probably need the prime factorization of the number that is doing the dividing. And in that case, it is 792. So let's go ahead and first notice that 792 is equal to eight times nine times 11. So there we factored it into co-prime integers. So we've got eight times nine times 11. So what we need to do is figure out x, y, z, so that this number right here is divisible by eight, it's divisible by nine, and it's divisible by 11. Well, there are some nice divisibility rules for nine and 11, which we'll review when we get to it. So let's first see what it would take for this thing to be divisible by eight. So I wanna start off and take this thing 1, 3, x, y, 4, 5, z, and notice that if we put some commas in there, it's pretty clear that this 1, 3, x, y is a multiple of 1,000, and then this 450, z is what's left over. Well, it turns out that 1,000 is a multiple of eight, so that means we only really need to worry about the four, five, z part. We can flesh that out like this. So this is equal to one, three, x, y times 1,000, but I'm gonna write 1,000 as 125 times eight plus 450, z. In order for eight to divide this whole number right here, then eight has to divide 450 Z. So let's see, what would it take for eight to divide four, five Z? So let's spell that out. So we need four, five Z to be eight times some unknown number here. So now we can notice that 456 is equal to eight times 57. And there are in fact no other multiples of 8 that are in the 450 something. And we can see that pretty clearly by noticing that 8 times 56 will be 448. So notice that has a tens digit of 4 instead of 5. But then 8 times 58 will be 464. That has a tens digit of 6 instead of 5. So all in all, we have figured out what this z component needs to be by just looking at these multiples of eight. So we've got immediately that z is equal to six. So now we just need to check two things. We need our new number, which we can just take this guy and replace z with six. So we've got one, three, x, y, four, five, six needs to be a multiple of nine and one, three, x, y, four, five, six needs to be a multiple of 11. So let's first recall that a number is a multiple of nine if and only if its digits sum to a multiple of nine. So just to reiterate that, we need one plus three plus x plus y plus four plus five plus six to be a multiple of nine. But now we can get rid of anything inside of this sum that totals to nine and just reabsorb it into the other side of the equation where we have a multiple of nine. So notice four plus five is equal to nine. So we can take that and move it to the other side 
and just absorb it into the multiple of nine, then three plus six is also nine. We can take that to the other side. So what we really need is x plus y plus one equal to a multiple of nine. Now let's move on to this multiple of 11. And there's actually a trick for deciding if a number is a multiple of 11. And that entails looking at the alternating sum of the digits instead of just the straightforward sum of the digits. So I'll let you guys look up a proof of that if you want to, but that's something nice to keep in mind. So I'll just put that in the following statement. So we have this is if and only if one minus three plus X minus Y plus four minus five plus six is a multiple of 11. So see, we did essentially the same thing that we did over here. It's just instead of taking a straightforward sum, we took an alternating sum. Now we can see what we've got. So notice that four plus six plus one is 11. So using a similar argument to what we did on this other side, we can get rid of that part. Let's see what we're left with. We're left with the need for X minus Y minus eight is a multiple of 11. So now we've gotten our problem down to these two conditions. So let's maybe move to those to the top and we'll finish it off. On the last board, we determined our digit Z had to be equal to six and that X plus Y plus one was a multiple of nine and X minus Y minus eight needed to be a multiple of 11. And let's recall that since X and Y are digits from this number, all of this is happening while X and Y are between zero and nine. But now this size constraint on X and Y really limits which multiples of nine and 11 are possible. And I'll let you guys think about it, but this limits us to having X plus Y plus one from the set nine or 18. So notice we cannot achieve zero times nine and we can't achieve three times nine or anything higher. So we just need X plus Y plus one to be either nine or 18. Those are the only two possibilities. And then furthermore, X minus Y minus eight must be from the set minus 11 and zero. And we can't achieve anything else. Notice we can't achieve 11 times one because we have these two minuses here. But now we can go ahead and take this one, maybe subtract it from both sides of the equation and take this minus eight and subtract it from both sides of the equation. And that leaves us with X plus Y must come from the set eight and 17 whereas X minus Y must come from the set negative three and eight. Now it's just a matter of looking at cases. So in order for X and Y to be integers, we need them to have the same parity. So that's not too hard to see. So that means our only two choices are each of these equations is equal to eight or the top equation is equal to 17 and the bottom equation is equal to negative three. So I'll focus on this first one and I'll let you guys think about if the second one provides us with another solution. So notice this first one gives us X plus Y equals eight and X minus Y is also equal to eight. So that's a pretty easy system of equations to solve. That pretty quickly gives us that X is equal to eight and Y is equal to zero, which tells us that our final number is equal to one, three, eight, zero, four, five, six. Like I said, I'll let you guys check if X plus Y equals 17 and X minus Y equals negative three provides us with another solution. Okay, so let's maybe go ahead and move on to this second problem. So let's look at this second problem. So I've reworded it a little bit, but it's essentially the same. So we wanna define a recursive sequence as follows. So A1 is equal to one, and then A n is equal to the product of A1 all the way up to A n minus one plus one. And our goal is to find this infinite sum from one to infinity of the reciprocal of the elements from this sequence, so one over a n. So whenever I see something like this, 
especially what it would look like after plugging in this recursive definition into the term in the series, that makes it look like we're summing up a rational function, but summing up a rational function is like integrating a rational function, which you would do with partial fraction decomposition. So this really motivates me to think if I can tweak this to use some methods from integration. And in fact, I can. So let's maybe get to that. So let's take a n plus one and write it as a one times all the way up to a n plus one. Just I've scaled it a little bit differently or I've indexed it a little bit differently so that it's easier to deal with. But next up, I wanna notice that this is equal to a one all the way up to a n minus one times a n plus one. So I've just associated those first terms together. But now I can take this product from a one to a n minus one and solve for that product in this defining equation by subtracting one from both sides. So I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna write it as a n minus one times a n plus one, like that. Now we can move this around a little bit more. So we've got a n plus one minus one equals a n minus one times a n. We can go ahead and take the reciprocal of this. We have one over a n plus one minus one equals one over a n times a n minus one. And the magic is happening here because we can maybe separate this guy with partial fractions being inspired by the fact that it looks something like one over x times x minus one. And then next, this a n plus one minus one term and this a n minus one term looks like it would probably create something like a telescoping series. Okay, so let's see if we can decompose this real quick. So I'll let you guys check the fairly straightforward details, but we can write this as one over x minus one minus one over x. So if we use this along with x set equal to a sub n, that'll help us out a lot. So that's gonna give us one over a n plus one minus one equals one over a n minus one minus one over a n. Now we can solve for this one over a n, and that gives us one over a n is equal to one over a n minus one minus one over a n plus one minus one. Now we've got some nice thing that looks like it might telescope, and it's a way of rewriting our goal term from our series. Okay, so let's maybe bring this information to the top and we'll finish it off. On the last board, we got this nice partial fraction type decomposition of our term from our goal series, which is one over a sub n. And I wanna point out that implicitly, we assumed that n was bigger than or equal to two along that calculation. So here I've put, be careful, that's only when n is bigger than or equal to two. Okay, so now let's go ahead and take our goal sum, which is the sum as n goes from one to infinity of one over a n. Let's write it as the limit as n goes to infinity, where I've used the capital N of the partial sums. So I'm gonna maybe simultaneously take the first term out. So that's gonna be one over a sub one plus this sum as n goes from two up to capital N of one over a sub n. But then by our initial condition, we know a sub one is equal to one. So that means this number is equal to one. We can take that out of the limit and we're left with one plus the limit as this capital N approaches infinity of the sum as N goes from two up to capital N of one over a sub N. Now we can go ahead and use our nice decomposition for this object right here. That's gonna give us one plus this limit as capital N goes to infinity of the sum as N goes from two to capital N of one over a N minus one. I'm gonna go ahead and split this into two sums minus this sum as N goes from two up to capital N of one over a sub n plus one minus one. 
Okay, now all that's left is a little bit of re-indexing. So let's maybe re-index this guy by replacing n with n minus one. So if n minus one is equal to two, that means that n is gonna be equal to three. So that's gonna change this to an n. It's gonna change this starting point to a three, and it's gonna change this ending point to an n plus one. But now notice that everything will cancel except for the n n equals two term from this sum and the n equals capital N plus one term from this sum because of our re-indexing. So that's gonna give us this is equal to one plus this limit as n goes to infinity of, well, let's look at the n equals two term. That's gonna be one over a sub two minus one. So let's write that down, a sub two minus one and then minus, well, what's this capital N plus one term? That's gonna be one over A sub capital N plus one minus one, like that. It's pretty easy to check that A sub two is equal to two. That makes this one over one. We can bring that outside of the limit and we have two minus this limit as capital N approaches infinity of one over a sub capital N plus one minus one. And now I'm not gonna check this carefully, but this sequence a sub N clearly grows without bound. In other words, as N goes to infinity, this a sub N term also approaches infinity, which means oriented in the denominator of a fraction like this, that will go towards zero. So that means we've got all of this bit heading off towards zero making our final value for our sum equal to two. And that's a good place to stop.